Okay, friends, this is my attempt at doing my top 50 books for the year. This is not books released in 2022. This is really just things I read on the hashtag my 500 comic goal on Twitter. I suppose after I do 50, I'll probably do something and uh, just figure out what was reasonably released in 2022 in collection form or something like that and uh, or individual issues and then... Um, see what my top 10 is. I'm not sure what it'll be. Um, cause I thought two of my two books in there, those magnetic press books that I've been talking about were, um, published in 2022, but at least one of them wasn't. So number, I'm just going to start. I think I'm going to do 11 this time around. I have some replacements in there, um, for when I read them digitally or I don't have them or the library didn't have them in time. So I'm just going to go right to start with number 50. Number 50 is Gulag Casual. This is by um Austin English um you know last month or two I started reading and listening and learning a little bit more about some of the more abstract comics um I don't I don't this you know this doesn't really meet um some of the definitions for what an abstract comic is because there's some semblance of a story but I think this is uh you know, where I was going towards. I just started reading um, the couple books I had and I borrowed um, a, a famous Fanagraphics abstract comics um, a book from a different library from Oregon or something like that. It's like a $200 book at least right now. So um, yeah, I enjoyed this. I actually read this twice. I read it again later and for whatever reason, sometimes I count rereads and sometimes I don't. Um, I did read a lot slower, um, the last time. That's probably what made it sneak in to the, to the top 50. Now, you know, um, there's sometimes where something might be good, but it's just not going to be my favorite, 100% my favorite style. So I'm very interested and like the concept of being this abstract and experimental. Um, same with say like some music, but it doesn't necessarily you know, it's, it might be something I discover and look into and stuff, but it's not necessarily my favorite thing. I think, you know, Brubaker and Criminal and those kind of books are another example of that, where I'm just not a crime nor guy. So, um, I don't like them as much as other people. So that's number 50. Um, <clears throat> this one sneaks in, I had to recheck it out from the library. This one sneaks in really because I, another guy that will appear on this list, um, maybe not today. Oh, I think he does appear today. Um, this one sneaks in because of the Thick Lines podcast with, uh, Mary Skelly and, um, I can't remember the other cartoonist's name, but it's one of her friends talk about comics and they have guests on occasionally and they talk about books. And so Dash Shaw talked about, uh, acting class. And this is one of those books that, you know, has some, something of a following maybe outside the alt comics world, not necessarily the superhero comics world. And they're conversation sort of made me like this a bit more. You almost have to take me ranking this at 49 with a, a grain of salt because uh, everything that they mentioned, you know, I did notice. It wasn't like I didn't notice some things, um, which was probably the case with uh, Chuckling What's It because I just listened to their podcast on that from a couple of years ago. Um, But, you know, they it just didn't, it was supposed to be flat. It felt flat and you know, it was fine. It was good. I have a like good vibes, good vibes toward it. When I read it, it did, it does go on a little bit long and you know, his, um, his, uh, artistry fits sort of the tone that he wants, but nonetheless, it's, you know, sometimes it gets a little, little tedious. Um, but, uh, overall it was cool. And I think, um, I think their talk is one of the things that made me, um, sort of get more into it and it probably <laughs> sneaked in there at the end. You know, it's a little, it's tough sometimes because you want to, there are some single issues that I think would drop in there, like this um, floating world book called Sea of Time, which I really liked, but it's a single issue. So, you know, maybe I'll, maybe it'll appear in the 2023 list as more come out. Um, the next book, uh, this one is a recently read also, and I enjoyed it a lot. This is The Three Escapes of Han Ardent. Um... So I'd never heard of this and I just bought it. You know, I walked into the record store that has, um, you know, will have like used, um, 
some used like graphic novels and comics and stuff. So I'd never heard of this. I don't even know if I should know Ken Crimstein, then, you know, I should, but I don't. And this was, um, you know, this was something that I thought was just going to be a bit of a history. Um, but I ended up, uh, really like, liking the way it was organized as far as this being three escapes. Um, and so Hen Arden is a pretty famous philosopher, I think because of how influential she was on maybe some of the, uh, the liberal side of political philosophy, she gets, um, sometimes compared to, uh, Ayn Rand a little bit. Um, in fact, even though I couldn't pick it up in Rorschach, Tom King was trying to sort of do a switcheroo, um, and base something on Hannah Ardent instead of, uh, what Rorschach was based on in, um, in, uh, Alan Moore's book. And I, I don't know, I don't know that that piece was, I enjoyed Rorschach a lot more than most people, but I don't know that that piece was successful or, or that I, I didn't get it. I just followed the murder mystery and some of the fun structural stuff in Rorschach is where I got the most out of it. But in this one, I mean, the three escapes are her escaping the actual Nazi, um, the, you know, Nazis taking over and getting into France and then also leaving France when France gets take o taken over. Uh, but then also an escape from a, uh, from a, a bit of a, um, like her sort of first love kind of thing, um, from a, another famous philosopher who actually mixed in with the Nazis a little bit. So, uh, you know, w when this happens, sometimes I don't like, uh, memoir type stuff because if I don't know a ton about it, then, you know, I feel like it doesn't matter how good the cartooning or drawing or art is. I feel like I don't have enough information. I need to go read an encyclopedia or a book or, or something with a lot more detail. Um, but then, you know, where that happened here and it's harder for me to, uh, make a, you know, make statements about what in here was truth or not. And what in here needed to be a story, just the, the way this was structured, um, around three escapes made this a very good and enjoyable book, uh, to sneak into the top 50 of the year. Next up is, uh Oh, ghost rider. So I, I liked the last volume of ghost rider. It got cut short and had a terrible quickie ending because of the pandemic. So they canceled it. And then they ended up tying up plot lines in the King and black storyline. It didn't make any sense, but they, you know, they did their best, I guess. Uh, this ghost rider is really cool. And my hot take on this is when I read this, it, that's a Maria Wolf cover right there. When I read this, it um, it actually reminds me of Immortal Hulk, and I like it a lot better. That's not Ghost Rider. I like it a ton better. Um, of course, you know where Immortal Hulk would catch up is that the uh, art is a little bit better in Immortal Hulk, but at least these artists aren't Nazis. I guess. I guess that's a plus too. Um, but you know, it has that feel where he's just traveling. I think it's going to get more superhero-y soon. Does that feel where he's just traveling around and there's some darkness inside of him and he's not sure um, his relationship to the, you know, to the Ghost Rider set of powers. A lot like Immortal Hulk, to be honest, but I think this is a a bit more grounded. Um, I would understand if someone didn't like it, especially considering that um, Immortal Hulk came out. Um, but I'm the only person, I don't, you know, I keep like, I Google it, I try to go look. Uh, you know, different people that enjoy enjoying Ghost Rider. No one seems to have pointed out that it feels like a mortal Hulk, but it does to me. So, you know, and then I think that sort of traveling about and uh, dealing with this darkness inside fits better for Ghost Rider than it does Hulk. But then again, um, that's what that 70s Hulk show was about. So Immortal Hulk in some ways is a throwback to that. But it, it's hard to say, you know, I... I didn't love Immortal Hulk because it did delve too far into the superhero stuff pretty quick. Um, but then again, that was 25 issues I read. I'm only on issue like 10 for Ghost Rider. So it, it can head that way too. But um, very enjoyable beginning run for Ghost Rider um, with, you know, horror elements like it should have really. Uh, next up. So where are we going here? At 46 is, I should have wrote the numbers down here, is uh, Newburn. Um, so like I said, I'm not a crime noir guy. I read a couple Brewbreaker books, but I enjoyed Newburn the best. I guess you can say, you know, 
I mean, it even has Sean Phillips' son on it. Um, I guess you say Sean Phillips is a little bit more a better, a little bit better, more practiced artist, but I, I like this art as much as anything personally. Um, Newburn gave me a little bit more of a, um, I guess a creative vent to it. It wasn't just some criminals or it wasn't just a, you know, I mean, reckless was great too, but I, I just enjoyed sort of the, the premise of this, of this character newborn that's set in the middle of these mob families and the police and, um, this intro intro character that'll probably eventually take over. We'll see. I'm sure newborn will, newborn will get hurt or injured at some point and be out for at least an arc. Um, but I think just a lot can happen with that. You know, this, it allows this to become, um, you know, a crime noir book. It allows it to become an action book. It allows it to become a mob book, uh, depending on the arc and where Chip Zdarsky wants to go with it. Um, so, you know, there, I think just, I just see a lot of hope in it and I can tell he has a bunch of, bunch of little character things in here that maybe, you know, they just haven't been discovered yet. Like the, like Newburn's driver, for example, probably has a big arc coming up because he's just sort of there right now. So, uh, a lot of fun and, um, you know, I, it, it has an epi episodic feel to it with each issue and, you know, that, and then some connective tissues for a, a greater arc, but, um, which that's okay. Uh, that feels like old school deep space nine or, you know, before everything became a, a serial. Um, and, and I guess that's cool. I mean, I guess maybe that'll make it a better show. I'm not sure that's what Zdarsky was going for. He seems to make fun of that, <clears throat> but, um, you know, he also seems to have a pop understanding, um, of, uh, writing comics too. So there was 46, 45 is, uh, this here. So later on and next is going to be a Paco Roca book, but, um, after this, but I have other Paco Roca books just to hold in front of the camera. But, um, 45 is a book called metal society by Zach Kaplan. I actually don't own any physical Zach Kaplan. I, I bought, I read this on hoopla and Zach Kaplan, along with Dennis camp is, um, you know, two writers I'm going to get more into in 2023, um, especially if they're available on Hoopla. So, um, um, you know, I want to read Agent of World or Agent of Chaos, whatever it was called. I've, it was one and then it changed. And um, yeah, Metal Society was solid. I don't, you know, I think I had more hope um, based on what other Zap Kaplan fans have said and talked about. Uh, but it actually was pretty good for a, you know, robot versus man kind of thing. Um, it was still a very solid book, good enough to, uh, sneak in here in the top 50, um, and, uh, be represented by this, uh, bag, not board. Um, uh, number 44 is Lighthouse by Pablo Roca. And, um, I read Lighthouse, uh, online. I feel, I really like Pablo Roca and I like, like, Winner of the Cartoonist, which I'll show in a second. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I bought this new... And I haven't read it yet. This is Treasure of the Black Swan. And I feel like I like and will read digital. But I, when, I, when I was looking at my list and making this list, as you see through the top 50, I kept thinking, man, I, I felt like I like, like these a lot more when I read them. You know, and now and I started noticing that some of the digital reads that I read are, you know, fell a little bit lower than I would have expected um, pre- all this. So this is, uh, this spot is for, um, uh, Lighthouse, which is an older Paco, Paco Roca book. And it's actually in black and white, but I really did love the Lighthouse. I may have to do a Paco Roca collection because I've been buying his newer books and stuff and go find the Lighthouse. Um, but that was a really good book. This gives you sort of an idea of what you get, but the lighthouse was, um, I can't wait to read this. I don't know why this is just sitting on my shelf, but the lighthouse was an incredibly enjoyable book. Um, you know, and I, I read it real fast because it, it sort of fits the best digital kind of book to read because it's all, it's very panel-y meaning, you know, meaning I don't have to, you know, I look at the full page and I think the full page, uh, is, is an important thing to look at and something like this, let's say, but, um, you know, Page to page, I don't have to worry about like, you know, giant Magneto over here and then he's shooting fire over here. And then, um, it, you know, it makes it like Jason who also the whole page matters, but, um, individual panels are very, are much more easier to read, um, in the context of, of, uh, my phone online. So there is Paco Roca with the lighthouse. Uh, next up at 43. 
three is Rodney Barnes, Nita Ha's Nightmare blog. This was a uh, a very, very cool book, and I think was going to be a very, very cool series. I have not read volume two. I don't think it's come out because I would have bought it. Um, and this, uh, this probably get a good re- reread for me too. Um, I found, I find in general that, uh, Philadelphia and this horror stuff, which, you know, that's another one. Horror is another thing that's not quite my bag, but, um, you know, Rodney Barnes packs enough in there and Jason Sean Alexander adds enough, um, you know, with his sort of style, his sort of paint, sometimes very collage-ish sort of style, um, adds a lot in there. Uh, I feel like there's something sitting in my book, a rock or something. What's, why is there a bump? Why is there a bump in my book? Anyway, um, so you'll see Philadelphia uh, further up the list, maybe not as high as some people would think, because I really do love it. But um, but um, yeah, uh, reading these again or slower, uh, is it's one of those that gives you a little bit more, you know. I do have to read volume four of Philadelphia again, because... Uh, I read it quick because I interview. I helped interview Rodney Barnes on uh, the Comic Chop News channel with um, uh, Jennifer from Comics Will Break Your Heart. I'll probably put a link down there uh, in the two videos that I mentioned Rodney Barnes books in. Uh, and next up uh, is The House, also by Pablo Roca. So two books in the 40s for Pablo Roca. This is not The House. This is The Winter Cartoonist. This finished pretty high a couple years ago. Uh, this is the first Paco Roca book I, I ever read, um, you know, and it was almost the image. It's almost like the image comics revolution. Well, that was a revolution. This was more of a, a cough in the wind, but, uh, that happened for cartoonists in, in Spain and, you know, the different shadings of the colorings are important for, uh, to know the time, um, period and stuff. And, just really enjoyed the storytelling here. Again, this one is something that could be read digital, but whatever reason, these guys I really do like um, solid. So, you know, I may read The Lighthouse and, and The House again. Um, and uh, I think I guess I did like The House a little bit more. I mean, they're so close, right? I could switch them around easily, The House and The Lighthouse. And then, you know, putting Nita Haas right in the middle sort of threw off. I had to go grab two Pacaroka books to look at that aren't representative of the one that I read that is on the list. And listen, I wanted to get these videos done. So this one, I, you know, number 41, we're actually going to go to 40 today. Uh, I actually re-checked out from the library, but I didn't want to go wait for it. So it is Discipline by Dash Shaw. Um, but I have this bottomless belly button, which I haven't read. I do a thing where I own books and then I don't read them because I, then I also want to check books out of library, but now there's like a timer on me and I got to finish them, especially if they're library books that are from the interlibrary loan, which I've been doing the last few months. Now I have a timer. I got to read them. So I've literally read, I've owned Sabrina from Nick Dronasso, you know, since it came out almost, well, around the, wh- whatever time would be where I could have bought it for cheap used. So maybe eight months after it came out or something, never read it, just sat there. Um, you know, and then when I heard acting classes coming out and, you know, I started reading some articles about, you know, the love hate with Dronasso, uh, among the comic world, which is sort of funny. Um, I read that his first book and then I read acting class when it came out and I, I own Sabrina's the only one I own and it's just sitting on the, on the shelf over there. And that's the same way with bottomless belly button, here, um, oh, actually this one's newer. I have another Dash Shaw that is sitting on the shelf. This one I just bought. Um, but it is not Bottomless Belly Button. It is Disciplined by da- Dash Shaw, which is a, a very sparse book, um, you know, and uh, not as not as wild and I don't, I don't want to say as other stuff's colorful. I mean, more sparse than this even. This is black and white or sepia tone black and white. Um, and so this I'll read, maybe not the whole thing this year. Uh, it says to read it in three parts. So I'll read at least one or two of the parts in it. <clears throat> uh, but discipline was really cool because it's like, you know, it's about a Quaker that has to go fight in the civil war. And, um, and it's just written in a, it's just drawn in a, I should have waited because that one's sort of special. It's a minimalist, but very awkward sort of style, um, that doesn't feel comic booky at all. And that was 41. I guess we're going to do 11 books. Number 40. I just stuffed all the X-Men book is in number 40. 
So that's Immortal X-Men. I mean, I can do, I'm probably going to do just for the hell of it, an X-Men ranking alone of the books or the miniseries or whatever. But I put Judgment Day and Immortal X-Men. I've uh, really enjoyed this. I love being knee deep with some time in this, you know, very detailed, crazy universe with uh, just crazy unending history and whatnot. Um, and Judgment Day was a, uh, to me, a great event. Um, one of the best ones in a long time, uh, as far as it not just being like Empire or another crisis, or even though it tries to tell you it's X-Men versus Eternals and Avengers in the middle, it really wasn't like that at all. It was all about, uh, you know, judgment and a lot of like, a lot of opportunity uh, for some um, personal and character intros introspection in these characters, even in the tie-in. So really like that. X-Men Red was great. Al Ewing got to use two of the most popular characters like uh, um, Storm and Magneto. I think that has, you know, that's some of the reason that this book is maybe a little bit more like the Immortal X-Men. Um, but again, Immortal X-Men did what, basically what I wanted from the X-Books. Not everything needs to be a team, um, but Immortal X-Men is a team, sort of. It's the whole council, but, you know, every, the individual issues looked at, looks more, they more look like build individual characters. So it's not like done in this like big story arc sort of way. Um, you know, the character building is happening in the context of what's happening in judgment day or it's happening at the moments uh, where, uh, you know, X-Men red is continuing sort of Al, Ewing, Al Ewing's um, X-Men cosmic stuff. Um, and he, you know, on Araco, Araco, and then he gets to use storm and Magneto. So two badass characters that everyone likes. And this uh, exterminator is sort of happening on the side, but it's just a, <clears throat> A lot of fun, like just sort of sexy, weird, and fun. So, um, yeah, all, all, the X books have been all good to me in a different way, even the ones that people are trying to hate on, like the new Marauders and and whatnot. So that's all I have. That is number fifty through number forty. That's eleven books for you guys. So thank you guys for checking this out, and I will uh, post the next ten or so up uh, in a few days.